then somebody's listening, huh? Oh, yeah. We know that they're listening, including the government. We're right close to Holloman Air Force Base and White Sands Missile Range. Oh, great. Does, does your broadcast cover those installations? It reaches out to where they do some special ops training in the uh, Red Rio area of the missile range. Uh huh. Well, wonderful. Well, that's great. We could just get some more people down there to cover the whole thing. What I would like to do is make sure every military person in this whole country gets to hear the truth about what's going on so they stop their uh, support of the treasonous activities and begin to honor their oath to protect and defend the Constitution for the United States of America against all enemies foreign, and here's the key words, and domestic. Yes, sir, I've brought that up before. We're also trying to get up a station down in Holloman, or not in Holloman, but uh, it's called Bowles Acres. It's right outside of Alamogordo, close to Holloman. Uh-huh. And that will cover Holloman. Great. If we can actually get it done. But that wasn't, of course, the reason that I called in. Uh, I'm sorry to disrupt your programming about that, the, your UFO. Well, that's okay. You know, if, if we hadn't caught it here, you would have caught it for us, and then we could have corrected it. Because... Uh, 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 later in the broadcast, we would have just been gone off the air because of the the batteries were so low in this key piece of equipment that uh, it it would have um, just wiped us out. So it's it's a good thing. That was the reason that I was calling in early, trying to uh, alert you to it. Well, great. Uh, fortunately, Annie was uh, on the ball and alerted me to it a little bit earlier than that. You're down by Holloman Air Force Base. What do you know about UFOs? Uh, well, anything at all? I know I've seen object or two that I couldn't understand what was, and I'm well versed in uh, observing aerial phenomena. What, what was it that you saw? Uh, one time it was two white objects that separated from one. Uh, at the same time, at about, oh, five to 6,000 feet, there was two F-15s flying nearby, uh -huh. and they separated and uh, had a trailer between them. But wait a minute, what do you mean by trailer? Well, some sort of a connection to them, and then they separated completely out. They seem to be uh, self-luminous. Okay, it's kind of like two rubber bands being stretched apart, and then they break? Right. Okay. And then, uh, as I was trying to get my binoculars, they disappeared. <laughs> well, you know, that's pretty... Like daylight. That's pretty classic sighting. I mean, I've heard uh, that description uh, many, many times. Uh, several emerging from one seem to be connected for a while well, for a very short time as they're parting each other and then that connection just sort of evaporates or, or, or uh, stretches thin and then moves in into the, one or the other um, and um, um, it's, it's a well-known classic type of sighting that nobody's ever explained um, at least not to me well I'm glad to hear that that's the first time I've, I've even had a good explanation of that this has occurred before. Oh, yeah, many, many times. Many people have seen exactly what you've seen. Uh, sometimes it's two coming out of one. Sometimes it's uh, three or four coming out of one. Uh, sometimes uh, the one uh, just uh, seems to uh, fragment into several, and, and there is no longer a one but a whole bunch. Uh, yeah, that's a classic UFO sighting. And I've seen a very large aircraft traveling very slow uh, of unknown origin. It looked, it was lit up like a Christmas tree with very colored light mm -hmm. at a very, oh, I'd say 25 to 30 miles into the range. Mm -hmm. They're what they call Mockingbird Gap. Yeah. And uh, most, most of these sightings, by the way, occur over or around well-known military test sites. Yeah, we've, we've had quite a bit of stuff here. We actually had an overflight here just recently by a Soviet helicopter. <laughs> yeah. A-27 Helic. They're all over the country. Yes, sir. Well, I got some real good photographs of it. it uh, well, send me some photographs and, and uh, explain it all, and we'll put it in Veritas. Oh, well, it's going to be in the next issue of a competitor's magazine. Oh, are you talking about uh, Media Bypass? No, sir. Uh, Free American. Oh, I never heard of that. The Free American uh, Clay Douglas? Never heard of it. Well, <laughs> it's it's a more or less local patriot uh, news magazine. Well, send us some pictures and we'll put it in a nationwide newspaper. Well, we'll certainly do that. Send you some color photographs. We had a confrontation with the Air Force over it. Really? And they sent out OSI agents and an FBI agent. And, and what, 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 what was their purpose? 
Well, they seemed to be upset because I'd fired a, a distress flare one night when there were too many helicopters coming over my area. I'm unlighted here. Well, good for you. It's about time somebody started putting the fear of God into these people who have been terrorizing Americans by by flying below 500 feet and hovering just above rooftops and setting down in people's yards. I am happy to hear it. Well, you, were, sir, are to be commended. Uh, they were very upset about it. They claimed that I had said that I'd fired it directly at them, which, of course, is impossible because they were unlighted. Mm-hmm. And when the flare went up, it went right between two of them. Oh, they were unlighted. So they were in direct violation of the law over civilian population areas where they, where the law says they must be lighted and they must be flying over 500 feet. Well, in, in this particular area, I'm at uh, south of Carrizosa, 16 miles south, uh-huh. and, uh, east of the railroad tracks, and uh, I'm in a civilian fly zone. Uh-huh. And uh, they have a 500-foot uh, unit no-fly over me. Uh-huh. From previous problems with the German Air Force, these tornadoes flying at treetop level. Yeah, all in violation of the law. Yes, sir. And uh, their response to that was, of course, to bring an FBI agent with them, unannounced. Well, that's okay. Tell the FBI agent to go screw himself. That's exactly what you should tell him. Well, we, uh, we had set this up in, instead of at the Sheriff's Department here in Lincoln County, we moved the location to my... In fact, what you should be doing is grilling the FBI agent as to why he's not prosecuting these people who are in blatant violation of the law. Well, that's that's part of the process that is, uh, may uh, proceed from this point on. Good. Uh, you know, I like you more and more. You just keep on talking. <laughs> this OSI agent apparently had said to the F- FBI over in Roswell the misinformation that I had specifically said that I'd fired at the helicopters. And uh, that conversation was taped, so I know I did not. And uh, at the table, whenever everybody arrived with the sheriff, we had the Lincoln County Sheriff James McSwain, chief deputy out there, and another deputy and the uh, chaplain, uh, and uh, about a half a militia unit. And these were UFOs, weren't they? Yes, sir, they were to my... You, you couldn't see them? And this helix, by the way, at night looks like a UFO because of the double rotors. Uh-huh. Any light on, uh, appearing on, on, against the uh, rotors makes it look like a flying disc. Yeah. And, of course, I spotlighted him with a million candle power floodlight, and they don't like that. Oh, I really like you. I just like you. Oh, we're going to be great friends. Well, actually, I've been trying to get in and talk to you about this. I love people with guts, and I love people who will not be intimidated by these federal Nazi jackbooted scum thugs. Well, we explained to them that our constitutional rights are non-negotiable. That's right. And that we will defend them at whatever cost. That's great. That's wonderful. And that, well, that's on tape. We videoed it and everything. Well, sir, you have uh, gained a, an, a preeminence very high in my esteem, and uh, I want to get to know you better. Well, my name is Jerry Carroll. <laughs> okay, Jerry, write me a letter, will you? And send me some pictures of those helicopters, and I'll get in contact with you, and uh, maybe we'll do a big story on this for Veritas. Well, great. I'm really appreciative of what you've been doing, and uh, I wanted to let you know what we're doing, and uh, we certainly do support you, sir. Well, thank you. We support you, too, when you stand up and, and do what you've, you've been doing. More people should be doing it. And stop cowering in fear when these Nazi jackbooted thug intimidators that fly around the country and beat down doors and rip up homes and tear apart families and, and uh, point guns at people from helicopter doors at point-blank range in the middle of the night. It's just absolutely... Uh, amazing that Americans are are taking this stuff. Well, we explained to them in no uncertain terms. You fly over us, uh, pointing a rifle, uh, a weapon of any sort, or firing blanks, and the proverbial brown stuff will hit the fan. Fantastic! I love it. That's exactly what should happen. Uh, nobody should ever allow them to get away with what they're doing. And our sheriff and our chief deputy was here to uh, explain to the FBI and the OSI. That this, this is not just my problem, that this was an entire countrywide and countywide problem, and that uh, there have been actually people firing at them. Wow. Not me, yeah. not my group. Uh-huh. But up in some other areas of the mountains, this is not a healthy place for 
people to be irritating other folks. Well, yeah, let me tell you something. If all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, we're awakened by this unbelievable noise, and, and I run outside and... and uh, and of course, I, when I hear something like that, I would always be armed. And I run outside and I look up and I see a helicopter with somebody in the in the door pointing a weapon at me. I'm going to shoot at them. Yes. I don't care who they I'm not going to stop to figure out who they belong to. The man is pointing a deadly weapon at me, and I'm not going to give him a chance to pull the trigger. That's I'm going to shoot him. That's what I explained to an FBI agent, you know, about these armed... Uh, uh, tornadoes. Yeah, and if he's firing, whether they're blanks or bullets, I don't know that. How am I supposed to know it? That's right. I'm going to protect my property and my life and the, the lives of my family. It's the perception that you have of defending yourself. That's right. And if it's a reasonable perception, then whatever you're doing is in self-defense. You better believe it. If somebody points a gun at you, it, you know, that is... Uh, that is always uh, grounds to uh, protect yourself and do whatever is necessary to make sure that they don't pull that trigger. Well, that was my interpretation of the law. Well, that is the law, and uh, you're absolutely yeah. right, and I'll support you in that at, at all, always, to the hilt. This FBI agent was also an attorney. <laughs> well, they all are. And, uh, well, I don't. Not, let me take that back. I don't know if they all are attorneys today, but I know there used to be a time when you couldn't be an FBI agent unless you had gone to law school. Well, I had an uh, uncle that was in the FBI, and I, he was a, a certified public accountant, uh -huh. CPA. And uh, I don't know if that was years ago. Well, I'm, I guess they may have taken some of those guys too in order to be able to count the beans to prosecute somebody that uh, who knows <laughs> but I remember one of the requirements was law school I remember that very well you know I used to the FBI used to be my hero I mean when I was a little boy it was J. Edgar Hoover's birthday I wrote him a letter wishing him a happy birthday and, and uh, he answered me back I have that letter to this day with his signature on it thanking me for wishing him happy birthday well they weren't always crutch no, they weren't. In fact, there was a time in this country when uh, when what we believed about it was true. And this agent that came out seemed to be a decent type of sort after we had any understanding. Oh, they always do. They're, they're well trained to talk to you in a manner that makes you think that they're your buddy so that you will be more receptive to their ideas. And maybe you'll tell them something. <laughs> well, I did right off. I told him to get off the property. Wonderful. And ran them off, and then we came back. Wonderful. And... Uh, discuss the situation further. Well, I'm always amenable to talk to them if they want to be peaceful and, and nice and uh, and there's some purpose to the conversation. Uh, beyond that, I don't have any use for them based upon uh, their, their recent history. Uh, they have no credibility. As far as I'm concerned, they are participating in the destruction of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and are actively involved in bringing about a one-world totalitarian socialist government and destroying uh, the creator-endowed rights of the American people. Unfortunately, I believe you're correct, 100%. Well, great. I want to thank you for calling. I really enjoyed this call. It's one of the most uplifting, one of the most wonderful calls that I've received in an awful long time. Well, sir, I'm going to certainly send you a packet. I'll send you also, I'd complain to the FAA and send the packets to them, too. Great, wonderful. I'm going to get you a... Uh, full color shoot this and uh, we've uh, started a petition a national petition if it's not gone national yet but uh, trying to uh, force the FAA through Congress to raise the AGL 1000 feet all aircraft except uh -huh. emergencies etc uh -huh. and also that all of these aircraft have to be clearly marked as the country of origin a branch of service and a ID number on it. Fantastic. I'll sign that petition. In fact, everybody I know will sign it. We'll put it in Veritas, and everybody that subscribes to Veritas I know will sign it. Fantastic. So you get us all that stuff, and we'll help you. We've got commissioners, and uh, the county attorney even signed it. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Thank you, sir. Thank you for calling. God bless you. God bless you, too. God bless all Americans who aren't cowards, who aren't afraid, who do the right thing instead of cowering in fear every time these jackbooted Nazi socialist thugs come around. I mean, I'm sick of it. I don't, I'm don't. i not taking it. I don't know about you folks, but I drew the line a long time ago, and that's why you're hearing this broadcast. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it's got to be. The number is 520-333-4578. And tonight we're talking about UFOs, and you can call in and talk about uh, 
your experiences with UFOs or ask questions if you want, whatever. I'm not going to take either side. I just want to discuss it tonight and uh, find out what's on your minds. I want to hear from people who, uh, who uh, feel that they've been abducted. I want to hear from people who have uh, seen uh, UFOs. I want to hear what your thoughts are about this. I want to discuss it. And I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to take a side for or against anything that you say. If you ask me a specific question, I'll give you a specific honest answer. Whether you like that answer or not, you know that's another thing. But if you ask me a question, I'm always uh, honest in my uh, in my response. So uh, you can count on that. Um, if you want to recount your experiences, if you've had any. If you want to talk about uh, or ask, you know, maybe a bench or something uh, subject for other uh, people to comment on, that's fine. But I want to talk about UFOs because I think it's a significant topic, and I'll tell you exactly why right now. <clears throat> Throughout the, uh, the history of the world, UFOs have never been um, in the forefront. In fact, uh, nobody has ever in the history of the world until uh, right around World War II ever discussed or brought up the subject or, or uh, you know, have, have ventured that there was any such thing as extraterrestrial visitation of this earth or that there could be aircraft flying around in our atmosphere that did not belong to any known government on earth. Uh, this is the assumption that's made. People make that assumption not understanding that there are secret projects that are being conducted by literally all of the governments on the earth uh, that could have produced such a thing. But that, you know, that uh, is, uh, is uh, up to uh, the different uh, perspectives and beliefs of different people. We have uh, evidence that this is probably the origin of, of most UF sightings, if not UFO sightings, if not all of them. But uh, you have to understand that there have been times in history where people have looked up in the sky and seen things that they could describe perfectly. For instance, in the 1800s, there was a spate of mysterious airship sightings that were uh, recounted in the headlines and in the stories of the newspapers across the country, and I mean all across the country, and from time to time, this mysterious airship would be sighted. And basically, what people saw was a big giant balloon with this, with this superstructure beneath it, and uh, the people that they described that they saw aboard this airship uh, were always, uh, without exception, uh, people just exactly like them, uh, wearing the same style clothing made out of the same type of cloth. And uh, wherever this airship was uh, said to have set down, it always engaged in the normal type things that people do. Conversation, uh, traded uh, goods for goods, and the goods they traded were never from some extraterrestrial source, but... We're just common, ordinary things, just like uh, could be found anywhere uh, on the Earth. And one point, one well-known story, was that uh, the airship uh, touched down and uh, somebody got off dressed in you know, a top hat and nice uh, clothes of the time and uh, traded some buckwheat cakes, cakes for some fertilizer. Don't ask me what they needed the fertilizer for. Maybe they were raising a garden on deck aboard this thing. I have no idea, folks. Uh, but you could read these stories in the newspapers of the time. They're legitimate stories. Uh, they're not uh, they're not wild, way out, loony bin type things. Somebody built an airship based upon a balloon, and they had some type of propulsion uh, propellers that made this thing go in the direction they wanted it to go. And um, and it was reported as being seen in various places at various times, always along the route that had had been reported as traveling before. So uh, that's really the first time that UFOs are, are really uh, mentioned. And it's not really a UFO because it can be identified as, as a balloon carrying human beings. Uh, you know, who owned it and what country it belonged to. Nobody knew that. But uh, they always spoke uh, good English, American English, whenever they talked to someone. So uh, the the conclusion, the logical conclusion, that it was somebody who lived in the United States or on the North American continent who built this uh, balloon-type airship with the, with the superstructure below it that was traveling around seeing the, the 
country from the air, I guess. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Now, all through the history of the world, and even on Columbus's voyage, uh, at one point on his voyage before he discovered America, he uh, wrote in his logbook that he saw ships of light sail silently across the sky. What does that mean? I don't know. He could have seen some meteors enter the atmosphere and travel you know, through the atmosphere and glow very brightly and then disappear into the distance. Um, that may have been what he saw. Nobody really knows what he meant by ships of light sailing silently across the sky. It's, you have to make a guess. In uh, some of the annals of the ancient Romans, there is reference to shields of light that appeared in the sky. Nobody knows what that could have been or what that means. It could have been reflections off of a cloud at sunset. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what they were talking about when they made those kinds of statements. But the real modern day type UFOs that are attributed to some extraterrestrial race from some other planet didn't really begin until the World War II and post-World War II era. And the term flying saucer was not coined until 1947 when a pilot claimed that he saw nine uh, glowing disc-shaped objects flying across the sky near Mount Rainier in Washington that came from the direction of Canada and went back in that direction. And uh, uh, some reporter, you know, said, uh, you mean they look like flying saucers? And he said, yeah, and that was, uh, that's where that term originated. But you have to understand the, uh, the time, ladies and gentlemen. That was a time in history when a tremendous war had been fought and pilots had reported something called Foo Fighters, uh, specifically bomber pilots, not fighter pilots, but bomber pilots had reported something called Foo Fighters, which were just glowing small disks that would come up and travel along with them uh, for a certain distance and then go on their way. But while the Foo Fighters were near the aircraft, they would have catastrophic electronic failures with their equipment. And uh, post-war, it was determined that this was a, a secret a German Nazi weapon uh, which um, was designed to fly alongside the bombers and put out a tremendous electromagnetic field, disrupt the electronics on the bombers, and uh, cause them to abort their mission um, and, and they were successful um, in some instances, other instances they were not. But they were never successful on a scale that prevented large-scale bombing of Germany both day and night, which resulted in the total collapse of, the, of their industrial capability to support the war. And um, we also know that secretly there were other uh, craft uh, being developed that were disc-shaped, that actually may have turned the tide of war against the Allies had these uh, craft been actually developed to where they would have been viable weapons platforms because nothing could have uh, maneuvered against them or, or uh, uh, been effective against them in the skies because of their speed and their m maneuverability. And they also had the, uh, the, the surprise element that they were totally unorthodox aircraft and and uh, would have instilled fear into whoever or whatever uh, they had they would have come up against. Uh, these craft were test flown on occasion, and uh, this is documented, and uh, it's it's well founded and proven in fact. And uh, and we know that uh, the Allies all got different pieces of this technology, and of course the scientists were all scooped up, and and we got some, and the Russians got some, and the British got some. And uh, nobody really knows um, how much of the actual hardware anybody got, but the, and your guess is just as good as mine. But we do know that around 1947, these disc-shaped craft that the German had be Germans had begun experimenting upon uh, before and during World War II, all of a sudden began appearing in the skies over America and Canada. That's the North American continent over the United States and Canada. And I have to apologize, I didn't mean to um, venture that uh, Canadians were not Americans, because they certainly are. Uh, 
And uh, all of a sudden, for years, there began to be many, many sightings all over the country. And there were, in fact, waves of flying saucer sightings. And then they would um, dissipate. And then there would be no sightings. And then um, at certain times, there would be, all of a sudden, another wave of UFO sightings. At one point in the 1950s, there were multiple sightings of UFOs over our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And we know that Hollywood quickly picked up on this, and there was a spate all through the 1950s, a tremendous uh, number of uh, uh, flying saucer movies, all with the same theme, I might add, that human beings were dangerous, and we were destroying our world, and the aliens came to warn us, and and stop us from this terrible activity because if we uh, weren't held in check, we could not only destroy our world, but their world and the universe and all of this other kind of bullshit. And uh, on and on and on and on and on. One of the, one of the, uh, the great classics that will illustrate all that I've just been telling you is The Day the Earth Stood Still with Michael Rennie and, uh, and uh, oh, what's her name? Um... Oh, my goodness, I can't believe I've forgotten her name. One of the great stars suffered a stroke and came back and, and taught her body how to function and, and just a great Patricia Neal. That's her name. Oh, my gosh, if I had not remembered that name, <laughs> I really would have been disappointed in myself because she's one of the really great actresses of all time and a truly brave and admirable woman. Uh, for the comeback that she made after she suffered a s severe stroke where she lost her power of speech and, and uh, total movement of, ex of, of one half of her whole body. And uh, uh, she didn't give up, and she came back and, and uh, talks just as normal as anybody else and, and has taught her body to, uh, to do all the things that it always could do despite the, the great loss of brain tissue um, that she suffered during that stroke. But... Uh, if you really want to see the great message post-World War II, it was that all humanity has to come together in one world government and disarm, <laughs> and disarm so that there will never be any more wars and so we won't threaten the other civilizations in the universe and all this kind of stuff. And um, it was all orchestrated. I believe that the Roswell incident was a part of that. Um, but when you call tonight and we talk about these, these subjects, um, you know, I'm not going to tell you what you should or should not believe. I just want to hear your opinions. And I will not give you uh, my opinion unless you specifically ask for it or ask me a specific question. And then I'll give you my truthful answer uh, to that. Um, the UFO phenomenon has never ceased to be a point of major interest of millions of people, not just in this country, but around the world. Um, there have been uh, uh, tremendous uh, sightings, uh, incidents. Um, for some reason, people always attribute the sighting to some extraterrestrial um, civilization with no evidence whatsoever in, in the whole history of the world that that is true. Um, and I don't really don't know why that is, unless it's just wishful or hopeful thinking. Um, wouldn't it be nice if there really was somebody out there who really did take an active interest in us and really did want to make sure that freedom and peace and, and good things prevailed in this world as well as uh, wherever else. Um, but that's a form of escapism. And uh, uh, up until the time we take calls, this commentary is mine. When we start taking calls, then the commentary will be yours. I would love if anybody in this whole world has any proof that extraterrestrials are real um, and that they're uh, visiting this earth. Um, I would just, I would love to see it. If real extraterrestrials really came here and landed in my, uh, on my mountaintop and got out and said, hey, Bill, why don't you come for a ride with us? Uh, we'll show you some wonderful things. I would not hesitate for a moment. Uh, but the fact is, no such thing has happened, and not to me not to anybody uh, that I can determine. There are an awful lot of interpretations and wishful thinking, and, and uh, there are an awful lot of people who believe that that has happened to them. Um, but nobody, and I mean nobody, ladies and gentlemen, has been able to prove yay or nay 
Uh, there just is no proof for, and really there's no proof against either. It's sort of a stalemate at this point. So let's take your calls. The number is 520-333-4543. If you've had a UFO experience, I want to hear about it. Where was it? What was it that you saw? What What is your uh, take on it? What do you believe about it? Do you... Uh, do you think that uh, it was from some other world? Could it possibly be from this world? Did you actually meet somebody face to face from what you, you know, that you believe was an extraterrestrial? And, and if so, what was the result of that uh, meeting? And I know there's an awful lot of you out there who are extremely interested in this type of thing and have uh, been involved in it for maybe many years. And uh, there are an awful lot of you I know who have had sightings of these craft. I have seen them uh, in the air on numerous occasions. When I was in the Navy on the USS Tyru SS-416, uh, I saw one of these crafts come up out of the water, tumble on its axis 180 degrees, and disappear up into a cloud layer. And uh, I was dumbstruck because it was huge. And up until that point, I thought all these stories about UFOs were just, uh, were just that, stories. But that sure changed my uh, my realization of the reality of the world, I can assure you. I knew from that point on that uh, they were real. And I'm not talking about UFOs. I'm talking about strange craft, the origin of which nobody can tell anybody else. Um, and uh, the purpose of which remains to this day uh, unknown. There are a lot of theories. I have my own ideas. I think I can prove some of my ideas. Other people may think that I'm full of baloney. But uh, that's neither here nor there. It woke me up to a different reality. It woke me up to the possibility of an unbelievable technology of which we know little or nothing about. And I'm talking about in the public sector. I firmly believe that regardless of the reality of whether it's of human origin or extraterrestrial origin, I know for a fact there are people in the government who know exactly what it is, where it's from, and how it works. And uh, I have been on this trail for many years. It was me that revealed to the world the, the location and purpose of Area 51 in the desert of Nevada, about 130 miles uh, north-northwest of Las Vegas along Highway 375, which now the state of Nevada has named the Extraterrestrial Highway due to the tens of thousands of people who travel that highway each year hoping to get a glimpse of of a real flying disc being test flown over the desert of Nevada. And not too long ago, we took a group of people uh, up there to Area 51, had an unbelievably marvelous time. Um, the group of people were in themselves um, worthy of just uh, going anywhere and spending time with. They were just so wonderful. And uh, all of them extremely brave because I took them places and we did things that most people would uh, hesitate to even consider, much less uh, follow my lead and, and just go along and do it. And I know that on a couple of occasions some of them were just petrified with fear. <laughs> Especially when we drove right up to the... Um, to the uh, limits of the BLM land where the signs are that says that use of deadly force is authorized. And they thought that we were all alone there and then all of a sudden, just across the line, this uh, security jeep full of armed thugs turned on their headlights and uh, <laughs> uh, it was like a bunch of mice scattering. Uh, people who had cameras uh, all of a sudden threw them in their car and locked the doors and pretended like they never had a camera in their hand. <laughs> Some people went and hid behind their cars. And, uh, it was uh, it was fun. And it was a normal reaction, ladies and gentlemen. These people were not cowards. If they were, they would never have gone that far. They were just surprised. It was a surprise. I had told them that the security would be waiting for us at that point, And I don't think they really believed me until it happened. Uh, because there's no time while you're in the Tickaboo Valley or anywhere near Area 51 that you are not under surveillance. You cannot be anywhere near that test site without being under surveillance the entire time, no matter what you're doing. Even if you don't even know it's there and you're just passing along the highway, somebody is watching you every single moment. The number is 520-333-4578. And in about five minutes, we're going to open the phones 
and we'll be talking about this, but I don't want, you know, to talk about it myself. I've been doing this for so many years. I want to hear what you have to say about it. I want to, I want to hear your stories. I want to hear your experiences. I want to hear what you think about it. And, and you don't have to tell me what you know I already think, because that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an open discussion where we hear what you out there in this audience think about the UFO phenomenon and what it means to you personally and where you think it's taking us. Now, I know some of you out there that are listening think this is the biggest bunch of baloney you ever heard and there's, uh, this is just a big waste of time and I want to tell you uh, that you're wrong. Whatever the truth of the UFO phenomena turns out to be, it will, and already is, in fact, affecting us all in a big way. And uh, if, if it's true that extraterrestrials are visiting this Earth, then it's the most significant event in the history of the world. If it's not true that extraterrestrials are visiting this Earth, then it is a tremendous propaganda manipulation in order to make us behave in certain ways and maybe accept certain things that we would not otherwise accept. So, uh, and if there is no reality to it whatsoever, uh, then sociologically it tells us something about ourselves that maybe uh, we had better begin to examine. I can tell you for an absolute fact that that's not the case. Uh, there is a tremendous reality to the UFO phenomenon, um, and, and uh, these things are real. They really do fly around in the atmosphere. They've been seen by millions of people all over the world, not just a few, few kooks and looney tune people. But I will tell you this. There is a group of people who call themselves ufologists. I call themselves ufologists. Um, and the people who... Uh, who um, are so immersed in this that it becomes their life that are truly in la-la land. These are the woo-woo people. Uh, they're over the edge. Uh, they have adopted uh, uh, realities in their own mind that aren't real at all. They're living in fantasy land. They believe that the benevolent space brother is going to save them from the realities and the terrible things that happen in this world. Uh, much like some Christians believe that they're going to be raptured and they're not going to go through any terrible times. And, and uh, it's a form of escapism. And there are others who uh, pursue this and, and promote it for profit and for agendas of their own. And um, the ultimate reality, in my estimation, is, is that if they can prove the reality or if they can make people believe that there is a reality of an extraterrestrial life form visiting this earth, then it's going to be used as an excuse to propel us into a one-world totalitarian socialist government. For if they exist, and they're technologically superior to us, and they found us first, so the theory goes, then they represent a threat. Whether they really are one or not, it is the responsibility of the leaders of the Earth to prepare to meet that threat should it ever materialize and the only way to do that is to make sure that the Earth is represented by one voice, by one police force, by one military. Uh, and that all boils down to, as Stanton Friedman says at the end of all his lectures, who speaks for planet Earth? Argentina? Red China? Would you like Haiti to represent you in negotiations with an extraterrestrial force that is technologically superior to anything on this Earth? Well, the answer to this, ladies and gentlemen, of course, is no. So, the logical conclusion is, well, we all must come together as one humanity, as President Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev said on numerous occasions, in order to oppose this threat and ensure. For, against this threat, wouldn't we all realize that we are one humanity after all? <laughs>
This is the voice of freedom. You're listening to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. We now return you to the hour of the time. to the hour of the time. The phones are open, folks. 520-333-4578. I want to get your input on this. What do you think about it? Have you had a, a, an experience? Do you know somebody who has? Uh, do you feel that you've been abducted? And have you ever spoken to a real live extraterrestrial? Now, I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm not going to ridicule you or anything. I really want to know what uh, is, uh, is going on out there, what's uh, in the minds of the listeners of this broadcast. What do you feel the reality of this is? Where do you think it's leading us? Uh, just recently, I was listening to um, some some people who uh, who uh, believe that uh, that uh, we're entering some kind of a a tremendous uh, um, escalation of uh, of. Uh, knowledge and spiritual development that is being perpetrated by this UFO experience. And uh, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> whatever it turns out to be, that's going to be true. Your interpretation of what that uh, um, growth and in intelligence and spiritual development is is, is, uh, is uh, subjective and open to discussion, but uh, I think uh, whatever the reality of it is, that it's definitely going to result in that. Good evening, you're on the air. Uh, yeah, Bill. Uh, something a little more mundane. This is Steve. Your audio level is uh, low again. You've barely been off the pin all evening again, sir. Really? Yeah, you were uh, had good level, but you How were that cl clipping uh, clipping out. You're up a little hotter now, or at least I show myself hotter. Well, we're not yeah. we're not clipping out again, are we? No, no. The clipping uh, clipping was corrected, but your audio level went down after. Your yeah, well, that's because I thought maybe we were overloading the Comrex, and I turned it down, forgot to turn it back. Hey, there's a picture of one disassembled in uh, uh, the history of World War Two. It's a uh, I, um rep document that I have here, and they had a picture of uh, one of those made out of uh, plywood. They represented it as a prototype, and uh, nothing more was said, but it was a steel truss frame covered with um, plywood, looks like, real thick uh, marine plywood, and was powered at that point by two of the jet engines, similar to use on the ME-262, and curiously enough, the picture was it was disassembled, being prepared for shipment. Ah. The, <laughs> the thing was on its side, but you could see some of the salient points, like the engine nacelles and uh, stuff like that. But the, the actual turbines weren't in it. It was disassembled. But you see the cross section of the saucer shape. Uh huh. And, and what, what 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 did you find that picture in? Um, history pic. I believe it's called the Pictorial History of uh, World War Two, and it was in the back as far as some of the booty and the high tech things like the uh, oh the two sixty two you know the V series yeah. uh, weapons and some of the other stuff that they were uh, working on and alluded to some of their uh, nuclear products progress, but didn't go into any, re de any re details or uh, um, any details on it. It was just sort of the, you know, the end of the book, and this is where it could have gone, think of the possibilities, no details. Yeah. Well, the possibility of a d Germany developing an atomic bomb was slim, since they had never uh, reached the stage of developing the heavy water that they needed, 
and uh, when they uh, w w began to actually uh, uh, go online with the only plant that they they had built to develop heavy water, we bombed it uh, into uh, eternity before they even produced so much as an ounce. Yeah, but they didn't go into a real wartime economic footing until 1943 as far as getting uh, serious, as far as very, uh, very costly long-term development. Yeah, but by that time we had air superiority and it was over. It was over. Yeah. Well, who published that book, do you know? Oh, I'd, I'd have to go get it, uh, Bill. I actually had it down here a, a, week or, uh, a week or so ago and threw it back up in the library. Uh -huh. Okay. But uh, the information's out there and there are pictures of, uh, of that exact thing. And then it just all falls off the radar. <laughs> Fancy that. Yeah, well, that's because when the yeah. when the governments that got that technology realized uh, how important it was and what they could do with it, uh, then, of course, they put down this veil of secrecy, which has existed to this day. Yeah, and I love what you're doing out there at uh, Groom Lake 51. I think that is just such a travesty that our tax dollars and our Constitution are allegedly supporting this, these people, and they won't tell us what they're uh, up to. I mean, it's oh, that isn't the half. budget thing's got to really be turned over. Yeah, well, that isn't even the half of it. According to the Overflight Treaty, uh, Russia and any other nation that's a signatory to the treaty uh, can fly over Area 51 at any time that they want to using the most... Uh, the most uh, uh, technologically developed and, and up-to-date uh, 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 spy equipment and photograph and listen to and and, uh, and uh, uh, discover exactly what we're doing there, but not one American citizen uh, can climb up on a mountain and even look at it with binoculars anymore. Yeah, it's a wonder who, who they trust. Well, they're just certain they don't trust us. Right. <laughs> Carry on, sir. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Thank you for calling, and thank you for your input there. 520-333-4578 is the number. And I want to hear from you out there in uh, radio land, satellite land, FM land, wherever you're listening, Internet land. I want you to call me right now at 520-333-4578 and tell me what you think about all this. Whatever you think about it is, is uh, fine with us. We want to hear what that is. We want to hear if you've had any experiences with these so-called UFOs. And UFO, folks, it simply means unidentified flying object. If you look up in the sky and you see a duck flying at 3,000 feet and you can't tell it's a duck, it's a UFO. And that's the truth. Because the term simply means unidentified flying object. And anything that you see in the sky that you cannot readily and quickly identify and uh, even later identify is a UFO. Most of them, for the most part, always turn out to be normal, average, everyday, explainable, mundane, normal things. There is a percentage however, that are not normal, average, everyday, mundane things and cannot be explained uh, by anybody, although some people try. Uh, they just don't succeed in most instances. I have seen these things myself on many occasions. I know other people who are credible, uh, honest, truthful people who have seen them and... Uh, Literally, there are millions of people around the world who have seen these uh, craft flying in our atmosphere. Uh, no one, to my knowledge, uh, can prove that they are of extraterrestrial origin or that they have ever been, or any of them have ever been of extraterrestrial origin, uh, are now of extraterrestrial origin, or ever could be, or that extraterrestrial life even exists anywhere in this universe. So that is all conjecture, and if you believe in that, that's okay with us. If you want to tell us what you believe and what your experiences are, that's what we want to hear. 520-333-4578, and as usual, if I don't get a call in two minutes, folks, I'm going to shut this down and go to bed and uh, not play this silly game that uh, you appear to be trying to play every night with this telephone thing. You want to have open call-in shows, but then when we have them, uh, it's almost as if you have to be pried uh, <laughs> loose from your couch and over to your telephone in order to make the calls. Once the calls start, 
they never stop. And that's just amazing. It's like, uh, it's like everybody's waiting for the first person to pick up the phone and dial. You now got one and a half minutes, ladies and gentlemen, to start the ball rolling, or it will be the end of the broadcast of the hour of the time for tonight. And I'm going to tell you something. If this kind of behavior continues, uh, I'm going to go back to one hour of just imparting information with rarely ever having uh, call-in shows like I used to do before. And you're now at the one-minute mark. And uh, and give up that second hour to somebody else like uh, Michael Cottingham, who will be following this broadcast beginning October the 1st, and you've got to hear him. I mean, he is just fantastic. Good evening. You're on the air. Hey, this is Charles in Georgia. Hi, Charles. I just couldn't let you go off the air. Well, good. What do you know about UFOs? I'm skeptical. Skeptical. Why? Well, I've never seen one, and I don't think if you'd never seen one, you'd believe in them. Well, the truth is, until I did, I didn't. You're, ab you're absolutely correct. Well, I think if they were not military, if they were from another planet, somebody would have... Uh, shot one down by now. Either shot one down or, would, or we would have some kind of proof that they were at least from some other planet. There, there, would be, there would be something, but there just isn't. And the other planets are so far away, they would have to have much superior transportation to what we have. Well, uh, get here. we don't know if we have that kind of transportation or not. They, i got to tell you that in secret... Uh, with these black budget projects, whatever you perceive as the state of the art of any given technology in, in the in the public arena, they're at least fifty to a hundred years ahead in secret. Were you aware of that? No. Well, that's the truth. Uh, the old priests of the mystery religion of Babylon have learned how to hoard the secrets and uh, and use them to control populations and. And uh, whether they're doing this with UFOs, um, I happen to uh, believe that they are, but other people believe that, that that's not the case. So, uh, how did you, what, what, is, what do you know about UFOs, if anything? you read any books on the subject? I did several years ago, and I reached the conclusion they were either military and or uh, people who were hysterical. Uh -huh. uh, power of suggestion. Uh, people would see things that they wanted to see just uh, just by staring off into space. Well, I think probably in some instances that that's probably exactly the case. I know that if you uh, look up in the sky on some nights, you'll see some stars that you'll swear are moving, and they blink all different colors, and people will swear that stars don't do that. The truth is, stars do do that. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, they will swear that they've seen uh, a, a, a UFO. And, and never mind that that star moves across the sky from uh, from uh, the east to west and, and, you know, sets just like all the other stars. But there are some unusual things that happen. If they're all stars, they should all come up and move across the sky and set on the other horizon. If you, however, open a camera lens while it's on a tripod and just leave the lens open so the stars track across the film, right. they will always be perpendicular to each other, or I should say parallel to each other, the tracks of the stars. If you see one of the tracks that's moving in any other direction, it's not a star, is it? Must not be. Uh, uh, speaking of horizons, I heard a show you did about a month ago about the fake photos from the moon. Yes. And there was something about the horizon you said would give it away as fake pictures. Well, I'd, I'd have to go back and listen to that tape. Nothing comes to mind right away, but then I was prepared to do that broadcast. <laughs> well, I think you said all the pictures had the horizon. Oh, yeah. Now I know what you're talking about. The horizon of focus of the camera was exactly 100 meters. So you think they filmed all that in some studio? Oh, they had to have, because they were using Hasselblad cameras, and in the kind of light that they would experience in space, in order to, pro in order to produce perfectly exposed color uh, film, uh, they would have had to stop the lens down to a very small aperture, in which case the, the uh, limit of focus would have been infinity. Well, I'm not sure I heard it on your show, or whether somebody just told me about it, but... 
I heard somewhere that when they were jumping on the moon, they should have been able to jump real high since the gravity is like one-sixth of Earth. That's correct. And they only jumped about a foot. That's, that's absolutely correct. And one other thing I heard was that the uh, transmission back to Earth took a real long time to get here. Uh, I've heard that also. That is not one of the things that I've investigated, though. I have a degree in photography, so most of my efforts have been uh, in the study of the photographs, and they're so easy to prove that they're fake. It's just unbelievable that anybody would even try to pawn them off as being legitimate photographs taken on the moon. Well, I appreciate your time, and I'll let somebody else jump on. Well, thank you for calling. See you later. 520-333-4578. This, uh, years ago, and it's even written in my book, folks, years ago I predicted that there would be uh, some secret uh, chambers uncovered under the Sphinx and the pyramids, and that there would be tunnels linking the two, and that they would uncover some vast storehouse of knowledge. Well, now that's coming true. They say that they have found the chambers, and they have found the tunnels, and they're they're excavating, but they're doing it in secret, and there's people who have been on the Art Bell Show and others uh, who claim that uh, that this is all linked to the uh, to uh, Richard Hoagland's discovery of artifacts on Mars uh, and the moon, which, by the way, are all taken by NASA, who faked the photographs. Therefore, it's all based upon... Um, um, the photographs of an, of an organization, an agency that's been proven to, to fake photographs. Um, but it's amazing how many of my predictions, in fact, all of them, <laughs> they, they come true. It just blows my mind. Uh, but they're so easy to predict. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, Bill. I did, this is Harvey. You know, hi, I'm one of your rebroadcasters, and I sincerely, you have won me over totally uh, with your program last night. I uh, really want to thank you for that constitutional program. It really moved me. I've read the Constitution, but that uh, production of it was so well done that I played it all night on my rebroadcasting unit here and uh, all afternoon. I just hope that somebody else heard it because it really moved me. And uh, on the UFO subject... Well, wait, let's go back to that. You know who produced that? You know who's really responsible for it? No. You know the actor Stacy Keach? Uh, I've heard that name. Stacy Keach is the one who produced that and, and is responsible for the whole thing. Well, it was beautiful. <laughs> it, it, I tell you, it really, 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 really moved me. And uh, it, it made me uh, really know why, uh, you know, uh, it made me feel like an American. I can't tell you. I, I just really can't put it in words. Uh, I did better on my own uh, little broadcasting unit than what I'm doing here tonight. Mm -hmm. But well, uh, they'll, 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 it was really well done. I, I just played it over and over and over. Well, great. So yeah. it had to move people that hurt, hurt it. Wonderful. There'll be more of that type of uh, program as, as the time goes by, I can assure you, because that's, that's the main thrust of this broadcast. Well, I just, I just I want to encourage people out there that to get uh, some kind of a unit, and uh, this time I won't mention any names, but get some kind of rebroadcaster. Let's make this work, people. This is a chance for us to take the airways back. Bill uh, has done a four and a half years or maybe longer than that up there working his butt off, get, uh, making, uh, what do you call it, uh, what's the word when you uh, research and he's the one, people. And I, I just want to encourage everybody, let's get our own, let's take the airways back, so get these broadcast units up and working. Don't make excuses. Don't be afraid of the FCC. Uh, they're more harmless than uh, UFOs, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, well, not all UFOs are harmless. There have been some cases where they have. Well, I don't know, you know. Apparently but... appeared to harm people. The Cash Lundrum case comes to mind where... Uh, they were driving their car, and all of a sudden there was this huge diamond-shaped UFO in front of them surrounded by military black helicopters, and um, everybody thought they were crazy, and all of a sudden their hair started falling out, and they began to demonstrate the classic symptoms of radiation sickness, and uh, they were, in fact, exposed to a tremendous uh, dose of radiation, which uh, caused them some tremendous uh, health problems for quite a while. Well, I definitely uh, disagree with the last gentleman uh, with respect. 
uh, that I do definitely believe that there are UFOs. Where they're from, I do not know, but I can tell you my experience, uh, what uh, my experience, and uh, I don't know how lightning it will be, but I'll tell you what happened to me and my wife. It was in the daytime. I've seen lights at night, which you couldn't uh, document, you might say. But uh, uh, this was in the daytime. We were coming up over a hill. We got, uh, it was a pretty steep hill. We were up over top of the hill. And it was a real gloomy, gray day here in Ohio. And we had some gloomy, gray days here, let me tell you. And all of a sudden, these uh, brilliant flashes of light and this V-shaped object, which was flying, uh, instead of flying with the point, uh, you know, where the point you, you think it would be flying in a V-shape, it would be flying, the, the point would be, it was flying the other way. Yeah, like a ship. I understand and, what I'm saying. Yeah, in the Navy we call the pointy end the bow. That's the one that goes first. Well, anyway, <laughs> but the, what got me, what was so spectacular, was there was a lot, there was quite a lot of traffic, and these big flashes of light, like I, I can only emphasize, like a hundred thousand times brighter than what a little flash bulb would be on a camera. And it was just like they were taking pictures. I mean, you know, this is in the daytime. There's flashes of light, you know. Uh -huh. And I thought, I thought, wow, people will be stopping on the highway and just say, what the hell was that? You know, I thought people would be pulling over thinking, is this the end of the world? What is it? You but, know. But nobody stopped? Nobody stopped. <laughs> so since nobody else was pulling over, I didn't know that. I kept going, too. But we were in amazement. So I told uh, my wife, I said, don't say anything. <laughs> Wait till we get back to the house. Oh, I, I want you to write down what you saw. You draw a picture of what you saw. Uh -huh. And then let me draw a picture of what I saw. So we went, you know, and I went to the kitchen. She went to the front room or whatever. And we both drew the same thing. Well, that's a good way to do it. And uh, what it was, I don't know, but I've never seen such bright lights. Yeah. like that in all my life what it was I had no idea I mean, it was not the sun flashing to the to the clouds or anything like that mm -hmm. I mean I've seen that that's rays that's not flashes but uh, is that a UFO I don't know is that well, if, a if, part plane if you couldn't identify it it's a UFO a UFO simply means unidentified flying object if it's flying in the air and you can't identify what it is and you've never heard or seen of anything like it before then it's definitely a UFO that was in the daytime, so I think that was highly unusual for the, the shape of the Ohio, craft. where we live to see something like that. Yeah, the shape of the craft that you described is is uh, is uh, one that uh, is pretty common that was seen over a specific valley in in the east. I forget the name of the valley. Uh, it'll come to me later, uh, but uh, it was seen for several years, uh, and sometimes would appear to just sit motionless in the air and sometimes would move very slowly uh, but the uh, bright light and daylight I had not heard before I've seen things like that uh, uh, arc light pardon I just said this is it it was in the daytime that was unusual and there was no sound yeah well that's typical with UFOs no sound um, go ahead I'm sorry I interrupted you oh no that's okay I was just going to say that I'd seen uh, bright flashes of light in the daylight, which turned out to be uh, practice arc-like missions by high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft, where they would drop a series of, uh, of um, some type of explosive or incendiary that would burn extremely fast and extremely bright. And when they use them at night, lights up the countryside brighter than the sun, and they would take their photographs with that. And sometimes they would practice their missions during the daytime. But we all knew what they were, uh, and they were never accompanied by some weird uh, delta-shaped craft that uh, that to move very slowly and strangely in the atmosphere. Well, I can only say that uh, that's what we saw, and uh, I just uh, tell you, Bill, that I just got speed on this, uh, you, and I want to thank you, and uh, I've really become a fan of yours. You won me over totally, uh, and... Uh, I can only say that I just hope that the people realize this is our chance to take the airways back and, and uh, have interesting shows and interesting guests. And uh, there was something else I wanted to tell you. Oh, yeah, I want to send in my uh, address and where I'm at and everything so that I can be counted and 
you can count for, on me for your, uh, you know, any support. Great. Sometime next month, uh, I don't know exactly when, we'll begin 24-hour day broadcasting. Uh, Jackie Petru will uh, will precede my broadcast. Uh, Michael Cottingham will uh, will be um, uh, coming on right after my broadcast. Uh, we are lining up some other excellent radio programming, uh, and it's going to be around the clock. You're just going to be amazed. We're going to have some old-time radio broadcasts. It's going to be wonderful. You know, Bill, uh, these people talk about the expense of this whole thing uh, as far as getting set up. And I don't want to, you've got a good deal of uh, what you've got, too. But they can also, uh, big dishes, a lot of people are, are getting rid of them, and they'll almost pay you to haul them out of their yard. That's right. I know some people uh, who have purchased. I can go out and get a dozen a day. Yeah, I know some people who have purchased complete uh, used satellite systems for as little as $100. Oh, yes. The whole thing. And uh, right. all you got to do is watch the penny saver and read the one ads or or the for sale ads in your newspaper and your penny saver and your bargain, whatever it is, and uh, you'll find them there. And you don't need much in the way of uh, equipment. And some of the equipment you've got at home, and there's stereo equipment and stuff like that, and amplifiers, you can put that to good use to uh, you know, for your bar- for your little studio. Yeah. You don't need a heck of a lot. Yeah, and if you want top-notch, good new equipment, uh, we've got the lowest prices that there are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, what you've got there, uh, I, I said it the last time I was on, it will last for years and years and years and years. And uh, it's just practically trouble-free, especially when it's not moving. You know, you're not going to be moving them a lot. Yeah, that's true. Uh, okay. Thank, okay. Thank you for your input, and thank you for calling. God bless. You too. Okay, bye. 520-333-4578 is the number, and it's your turn. Yes, you, right there. I'm talking to you. I'm pointing right at your belly button as you sit on that couch, and here you are. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, I don't. Hi. This is Carl in Florida. I knew you knew I was pointing at you. <laughs> you sound over the phone. You sound like somebody I know. <laughs> um, well, I've been listening to you for years. Maybe I am. Maybe nobody really knows who the real Bill Cooper is. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe it is the guy that you know. Let me tell you, Bill, I've been following you for a long time, and I agree with everything you say. Oh, no. You've been following me for a long That means you saw me go into that phone booth and change my clothes, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is my friend put me on. But, um, remember Thatcher, Arizona? Thatcher, Arizona? No, I don't, as a matter of fact. If people assume I know everything, I really don't. You were a ufologist yourself, remember? I've never been a ufologist. Never, ever. Oh, uh, well, I have a tape of you giving a lecture. Yeah, I was giving a lecture about things that I saw, uh-huh. documentation that I saw when I was with the Office of Naval Intelligence. Right, you're absolutely right. And I was trying to warn people about what that meant to our Constitution and about the future of the world. I understand, but I've been following you ever since. And I've listened to just about every one of your programs. Wonderful. I still keep up with you fool with yourself. Uh huh. Um, just for information. Well, I try to do that too. Um, last week I heard a person on a radio show. And would you want me to give him a plug or not? Sure, go ahead. Um, it's UFO update. Uh huh. Where where is that? I've never heard of that. Radio uh, network. Pardon? On the cable radio network on satellite. Cable radio network on satellite. UFO update. Yeah. So on the. Who's the host? Um. Well, it was your old friend, but they dropped him about uh, eight weeks ago. Who was that? Ecker. Ecker. Oh, that phony creep. Now, all of a sudden, he wasn't on anymore. Well, uh, people are finding out what a phony liar he is. Okay, and they went for two weeks with no program. Then they came out with a new program. Uh-huh. The UFO update. Well, good. I hope it's objective, and I hope the host is uh, is uh, more truthful and and uh, more honest and more objective than uh, the Necker was. If he if he is, he'll have a successful program. And if he is, I'd be interested in talking to him about uh, being on our network. Um, Michael Sheldon. <laughs> I hope you can hear that. Oh, I can hear it. What's your scanner on? That's the radio. Somebody was. Oh. Screaming. Um, uh, Joe Dale is the host. Joe Dale. Don't know him. No. He's, uh, I'm not sure who he is. He's 
a fairly young fellow, and he didn't even know about uh, the Mantell deal. Uh huh. You remember that one? Oh well, he's really new to all this. So they had a filling man. Yeah. The last week. Yeah, I know about the Mantell incident, the P fifty one. The... I do too. I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we got the um, live well, broadcast from there. Yeah, well that's they broke in. We're, yeah. Okay. So I've been around for a while. Um, in fact, I was around at the beginning, at the beginning in '47. Uh huh. Um. Anyhow, they oh, oh. this. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So-called guy Sheldon Nidal, who I have never heard of, and uh, he's got some books and he's been lecturing, and he claims he was abducted when he was nine years old, and so forth and so on. And he uh, says he can channel, which he did on the program. You know, I'm, I don't know about channeling. And he said that after the eclipse, you know, we're going to have a lunar eclipse on the uh, 26th <coughs> total in the, in the United States. It's going to be the last one for a long time. He says after that, they're going to start flying in the daytime. And they've told the United States government to get their airplanes out of the air because uh, they don't want to have to take them out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I just can't buy that. <laughs> well, I mean, he's, he's going to be out of business because that's pretty soon now. Yeah, really. He's blowing, he's blowing his whole thing. Well, that's like old Brother Stare. What was it in uh, July we were supposed to be nuked by the Russians? Yeah, uh, <laughs> they're with him also. Yeah. Uh, and his other 500 other prophecies that never came true? Right. Yeah, when somebody starts channeling, I leave the room usually. Yeah, well, I'm just, if uh, this guy's blowing his whole scheme that he's been working on for years, because... Yeah. Do you remember the total eclipse in uh, Mexico a few years back? Uh-huh. And then right after that, the, the UFO started showing up. Yeah, over Mexico City and other well, places. Well, they're still flying, evidently. Uh, well, that's what they say. Well, I've seen some pretty good pictures now, you know, but you know uh -huh. how pictures are. Well, photographs can be faked real easy now. I, I know that. I do a little photography, a little astronomy, a yeah. radio. And I didn't think it was so easy to fake videotape until I saw the Billy Meyer stuff, and then I realized it's a lot easier than what we thought. Well, he didn't have videotape. <laughs> Well, he had film, but they put it on videotape, and that's what you see in this country. Nobody's looking at film here. Well, there's some pretty good stills, but, you know, they could be fake. I well, I guarantee you, we've already, we've already uh, subjected many of the stills from Billy Myers to analysis, and they are fake, with, with no doubt. Uh, okay, no um, you need to get somebody really good. Maybe when um, Gary Bourgeois gets back in circulation... He can fill you people in on uh, some radio jargon. Radio jargon? Yeah. Um, everybody refers to a linear amplifier. Uh huh. That is um, only used in AM broadcasting. Well, what do you call it with FM broadcasting? Between the transmitter it's, and the antenna? It's a class C amplifier. Class C amplifier. And. Uh, uh, different from an amplitude modulated transmitter. Uh -huh. so Steve, well, nobody knows what you're talking about anyway. <laughs> well, um, unfortunately, for FM, don't refer to it as a linear amplifier because this is not a not a linear amplifier. Yeah. Okay. Non-linear amp. So it's a it's a what? It's a class C. There's A, B, and C uh -huh. basically. <laughs> a amp is linear, but completely linear. You know what linear means. Yeah, in line. I know what you're Yeah, talking. right. And that's what you use in audio. Uh-huh. In, um, in RF, like in CW, you use a class C. Yeah. Uh, the carrier's only on half of the time in class C. It's, uh, you know about AC. If you make a spike and shut it off, it will drop back down. Yeah. And you'll have AC. Mm-hmm. Well... And amplitude modulation, you can't do that. It'll be all distorted. But in FM, you can use a class C amp. Okay. Class C amp is much, much more efficient than a class A. Class A, uh, you're wasting about half of the power that's going in. I see. So um, when you're talking about FM, it's just an, call it either an RF amp, or just call it an RF amp. 
radio frequency amp. So. Okay. All right. From now on, it's an RF amp. You all, you guys, hear me out there? <laughs> we have been educated. Linear is something the CBers uh, they call a linear. They're not even uh, you know they don't speak the, the English uh, too good. So they call it a linear amp. Well, all you gotta do is listen to their broadcast, and you know they well, speak English too good. Really run a class C on those amps, <laughs> and that's why it's so distorted. Whatever they're running, it's uh, it's really screwed up. I, I want to tie it up. Let somebody else get in. Okay. I wasn't like, going to let you go off the air, so I thought I'd call. Well, thank you. Okay. Bye. Good night. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight is the number. That was an interesting call. Now we know that uh, we don't refer to these things for FM broadcasting as linear amplifiers. They are RF amplifiers. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, Bill, how you doing? Good. This is Ernie up in Wisconsin here. Hi, Ernie. What do you know about UFOs? Well, I tell you, back in 1965, I lived up in a little town called uh, Park Falls, Wisconsin. What's the name of it? Park Falls, Wisconsin. Little Par- town. Park Falls? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's like the north northwestern part of Wisconsin. Okay. Well, anyway, I was, I, uh, we were outside one night, and we seen little lights flashing in the sky and stuff, and they were there for like about 30 to 45 minutes about and all the neighbors were out, they'd go up and across and different bright lights. Well, needless to say, after a half hour into it, we heard two sonic booms. And apparently they sent up uh, some fighters from, the, uh, it used to be an air base up in Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah. And they, I think they were the older F-102s, whatever. And uh, we, uh, they came right over, they came right over and just heard the booms and then, they were apparently trying to go after him or something, but they just shot and totally disappeared. And the lady next to us, I remember that she was like, a, I believe, she was from Germany. She was like a war brider type thing. And she said that she hadn't seen anything like that since the, just about towards the closing of the war in Germany. She said she's seen them quite a bit over there. There was a lot of activity, you know, down the closing year of the war. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and I said, you know, she's kind of asked me, she said, oh, I haven't seen this since, you know, since the cold end of the war, there's a lot of UFO type objects and stuff too. She says uh, she knew uh, pilots even in the Luftwaffe that seen them, uh-huh. and they didn't, you know. But you know, they, she they, she didn't get into much detail, but she just said that she was aware that in the war there was a lot of sightings of that. Yeah. And uh, but uh, yeah, I'm working on converting a um, a um, amateur radio for your um, FM broadcast deal here. I have a satellite, and, but I used to listen to you on short wave. But as we know, that ain't working no more. <laughs> How in the world would you convert an amateur radio to broadcast FM? Actually, you got to, on the older crystal ones, you can do that. You, you guys amaze me. You, <laughs> <laughs> you just know how to do everything out there with the radios, the things I never even dreamed you could do. I, every time I talk to one of you guys, you blow my mind. Well, you know, it's um, it's a hobby, you know, but <laughs> I was on that little um, milliwatt thing just around the house here, but uh, yeah. I'm working on converting something a little bit. Are you talking about stuff like the old Collins receivers? And no, this is old. Um, actually, this was an old um, commercial. It was originally a commercial pager system, a Motorola type. Oh. It's a tube type. Uh-huh. The real common, um, a real common. Um, so that's not really amateur radio. That was a, a, a pager system? Yeah, I converted it over for the uh, to be used on the... Um, on like for six or two meters, it could go either way. Uh-huh. You know, from 50 megahertz up to like maybe 150. Uh-huh. And what I did, I had just like a like a relay, like a little repeater here. But since I got it offline, I was going to convert it for the FM broadcast. Yeah. And I think so. So it should work pretty good. But um, I was going to say too. A few months ago, I think I sent you a old Reader's Digest. I don't know if you received that or not. But, what was the subject? Um, it was uh, February 41. There was just some subjects in there about. You talk about how the economics are controlled by... by oh, the, yes, yes. I, uh, we, I did get it. Yes, I did. Yeah, and uh, I thought that was quite interesting, that article, and even before, I mean, February 41, we weren't even really in it, but how they're already manipulating the economy. Yes. And how people were saying that Japan's buying our scrap and turning into weapons and nobody's paying attention, you know? Yeah. And I just thought that was kind of a neat... <laughs> it was wonderful. It, it, it is neat, and it's extremely educational. To read that, yeah, it's very educational. You read that and you go, people were aware of this stuff back then. Yeah. But yet, nobody really reacted or, or, or did anything like that. And I just think that's amazing. But I just like call in and say, I, I got some satellite, too. I put, together my, I put together my system for about 100 bucks too, so... Okay. I read it, uh, somebody 
a buddy of mine runs a TV shop, and somebody wanted one of them little dish, dishes put in. Mm -hmm. And we put it in, and he goes, why are you doing this house? He goes, you guys want this, you can have it. So basically we hauled it away, and I got a couple cheap receivers and put them together and got a system going, you know. So, oh, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's, you can do it pretty economical. Now, a lot of you are going to that smaller dish, and like you said, read your shoppers or even check with your um, satellite or TV places, you know. It's, and yeah, sometimes they get trade-ins or stuff that they, sure. they, they don't want to mess with. They just soon get rid of it. Like I said, I have an older an older system. It was called a bird view system. It's not exactly, you know, the most modern, but I got like about eight receivers, you know, so I'll n always have parts, you know. <laughs> As long as it works, that's oh, what sure. counts. Some of the best radio receivers and transmitters in the world were made back in the 20s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I collect all the radios, too. I have a... And this microphone that I'm using right now is made back in the 20s, and it's the best that there is still today. You oh, cannot I... get anything better than this. It's an electro voice, I believe, isn't it? Or... It's an RCA 44BX. Oh, yeah. Them are wonderful mics. Yeah. I like listening to, um, I like listening to, I always listen to a shortwave. I have an old Delco uh, 4 model radio with like the old Philco shortwave. Uh -huh. I always listen to you on that, you know, and it's just something about the <laughs> tube sound, you know. It's, uh, it's just a classic sound, I guess you can say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if you've ever heard one of those old radio, there be there are people now who are collecting them and restoring them. And if you got a lot of money, you can even buy one, but uh, it costs so much that it's yeah, prohibitive. Yeah, I've heard a couple myself, you know. They have the most incredible sound you've ever heard. Because it's, it's, when I was a kid growing up, you know, I, I'd sit there and listen to radio teletype and CW on that old one we had just because I thought it was neat. Yeah. You know, I, I, tell, my, I tell my sons, this is, you know, I think nowadays you guys are missing out on some of the real treat of what radio was like. You know, you had to use your imagination a little bit, you know? Yeah, I remember that. When I, was, uh, when I was a boy, my mom would tuck us in the bed at night, and then she would turn on the radio and we would listen to suspense and and uh, the whistler and the creaking door and, yeah and uh then you know sometime during there you'd drift off to sleep and you you wouldn't uh <laughs> would, wouldn't hear at all but uh but i remember laying there in the dark and i could see the whistler lurking in the shadows and <laughs> in your mind you could see the whole thing it was better than television ever dreamed of being because you could create in your mind Whatever your mind wanted to put there instead of having something put there for you. Yeah, that was really neat. Well, I'll let somebody else jump on in here. I know we're getting about 15 minutes here. But, yeah, well, I just wanted to see if you got that. And, like I said, I'm, I'm definitely going to get you back on the air up here anyway. And, uh, Great. Nice getting into you. And um, you did send me some information for, uh, for buying some books and stuff, too. I appreciate you returned my letters. So, But, um, well, thanks a lot, Bill, and God bless you. You're welcome. Bye. Good night, and thank you for calling. Oh, by the way, folks, before I forget to tell you, all the information packs have gone out on the satellite system and the low-power FM transmitter and the sales uh, items and the tapes and all of that kind of stuff. They're all in the mail, so you can be expecting to be receiving them uh, within the next few days. Um, and, uh, we're, you know, we're extending this sale probably till the end of October, and then it will end uh, and or maybe the 15th of October, I'm not sure, uh, but it will definitely go past the 30th of September when everybody thought it was going to end. For right now, let's just set it at the 15th of October and leave it at that. So the sale will end the 15th of October. All the info packs are out to you. If you haven't sent for an info pack, please do now so that we can get it to you before the sale ends. And uh, everything that we have is on sale, folks, except for Oklahoma City Day 1. We cannot put that on sale. If we don't get back our investment in that, we're down the tubes. And there is no doubt about it. So uh, we can't put Oklahoma City Day 1 on sale at all. And don't forget, uh, if you haven't ordered your copy of Oklahoma City Day 1, they have been printed. They have been bound, except for the hardback uh, collector's edition. Uh, that will be uh, in... in uh, in process of manufacture a little bit longer because uh, we're getting top quality binding. The pages are going to be sewn and the binding is just tops. I mean, you can't get better quality. So uh, the collector's editions will be coming later, but the uh, paper trade uh, books are on their way now. They're on a truck on the way here. And I don't know how many days it's going to take for them to get here, but as soon as they get here, we're bringing Michelle Moore in to uh, sign all the books that uh, that have been ordered signed. And you cannot order any more paper trade books signed, ladies and gentlemen. We are not doing it anymore. If you want a signed autographed edition, you have to buy the collector's hardbound edition. 
which is uh, limited to 500 copies. It's hardbound. It's a top quality book. Uh, it's a first edition. Collectors limited to 500 uh, copies, period, in the whole wide world. And that's $65 post paid for the collector's edition. If you want the regular paper trade, it's $35 post paid. Get your orders in now because they're on the way. And as soon as they get here, uh, the ones that uh, don't need to be autographed are going to be sent out immediately. The ones that need to be autographed, as soon as Michelle puts her John Hancock in there, they're going to be going out too. So, anyway, that's that. 520-333-4578. Give me a call. Tell me what's going on with the UFO thing with you. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, Bill. Uh, this is Fred in California. Hi, Fred. Um, say, uh, on the... Uh I don't have any flying saucer stories of my own, really, um, but uh, I have a book uh, called Space Aliens from the Pentagon by William R. Lyne, L-Y-N-E. Yeah. Have you ever seen this? Well, tell me what it's about, and I'll tell you whether I've seen it. Yeah, it's subtitled Flying Saucers Are Man-Made Electrical Machines. Yes, I have seen it. Mm -hmm. um, the guy that lives in New Mexico, right? Yes. Yes, huh? okay. Yeah, it's a very good. He misinterpreted my uh, my take on the thing. Uh -huh. and a lot of people do that because they fail to call me and ask me about it before they go off the deep end. But anyway, it's very good, uh, and I highly recommend it. Yes, it's it's one of the most enjoyable books I've ever seen. Uh, it stands right along with yours as far as I'm concerned for uh, the kind of a book that you can open to any page and and uh, you're, you're hooked. Yeah. So, and uh, he's in uh, Lamy, New Mexico. Uh -huh. L-A-M-Y, General Delivery, Lamy, New Mexico. And uh, the book is uh, 17.95 plus postage. So. Uh, what's what? 